Hey everybody, welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. It's Labor Day coming up, Labor Day. So we're going to talk about Labor Day. I'm here with Ron Placone and Melissa, Miserable Liberal. Oh, hi, Jimmy. Hi. Oh, look, they're using the Jimmy Dore Show mugs you can get right underneath. And she's wearing a Jimmy Dore Two Show t-shirt. Two variations of mugs. Look at that. So that's a great way to help support the show, right underneath. Thank you so much for going to our store. There's a link underneath. We're going to talk about Labor Day, right? Because people, uh, people need to know about it, especially in this day and age, when half the country and the richest country in the world, half of its population is poor or low income and the richest country in the world. And why is that? We used to have the biggest middle class. We used to brag about people could come here and you could make it if you worked hard. Now there's more mobility in Europe than there is in the United States. So here we go. There's, this is from CNN Money. Please. Labor conditions were pretty hard. A lot of new immigrants were coming to America. They were reasonably unskilled, but often quite cheap labor, and they were exploited for such. So that the typical work day could be 12 hours. Uh, they often worked six days a week, sometimes seven days a week. Child labor was not allowed, but it wasn't regulated, and so kids as young as six, seven, eight, ten worked in the mills. And the conditions were not terribly safe. There were terrible accidents that occurred. The first Labor Day was uh, September 1882. The founder probably was Matthew McGuire. He helped organize a major march and demonstration to affirm labor's rights. And 10,000 people marched. That was a Tuesday. It was the first Tuesday in September. What triggered a national Labor Day in 1894 was a rather dramatic strike that took place. The Pullman workers in Chicago went out on strike. The federal government intervened because the Pullman cars basically ended up with a boycott of them, stopped the American railway system from operating. So the federal troops were called out to crush the strike. People were killed. It was a terribly violent strike. It was not a happy day for labor. Government, being politicians, wanted labor on their side. And so as a concession, they then passed legislation authorizing a labor day. First Monday in September from then on. Labor Day has evolved. So that came out of, hey, you're going to have, you want to do something for yourselves, labor? You're going to go up, you're going to unions, you want to do a strike? Well, we're going to send in, tr it's just amazing that, by the way, that hired thugs for the government just go brutalize their fellow citizens at, at the, they give, they're given an order, okay, these guys are workers at a railroad, I'm going to get the army in there, kill them. <laughs> what? And they just do it. They just do it. Isn't that funny? Because that's what you're taught in the military, right? Um, yes, here they are. They want protections. Right. In their, they want worker protections. Yeah, they want worker protections. And then they have to fight their own government who's going to come out and brutalize them. Literally brutalize, kill them. Kill them. So, and so as a, uh, as a really a woeful uh Woefully lacking, like, apology or whatever it was. Here, we'll give you Labor Day. All right, so here we are. Monday in September from then on. Labor Day has evolved since 1894. Increasingly, even the marches and the parades became really opportunities to, to be for a patriotic holiday more than actually a celebration of labor, per se. But the union makes us strong. We have paid holidays because of the labor movement. We have a eight hour day because of the labor movement. We have paid vacations because of a labor movement. We have health care, those of us who still have it, because of the labor movement. And it's a chance really to recognize those kinds of gains. But over time, it's become much more than that. It has become, for all of us, the marker of the end of summer, the beginning of school, an opportunity for picnics, for barbecues. In its own way, ironically, Labor Day is as much about consumption as it is about labor nowadays. I'd like to think that the problems facing labor and unemployment are on people's minds. I'm sure that they are on people's minds. I'm not sure that Labor Day is triggering those concerns anymore. And that's unfortunate. And, you know, people think... Uh People think that uh, our economy or capitalist society is just the way things are supposed to be, right? Like as if Jesus invented this kind of economy and they were, and it's just, if you work, you get, and they don't understand that, no, people create economies. They're invented. Free markets, are, there's no such thing. All markets are regulated. And so it's just how you regulate them. Do you regulate them to help 
the uh, the workers? Do you help regulate them to uh, increase predatory capitalism? Do you regulate them in a way that helps uh, workers share in the profits of their labor? And how can you do that? How can you ensure that workers share in the profits? Well, maybe you, you make it so the laws favor strong unions. So right now, the laws make it hard to join a union, make it hard to form a union right now. So maybe you change those laws. So that's, that's what I'm talking about. You, you're inventing a system. You've decided to make uh, uh, management more powerful than workers. That's what the laws have done. So it, you get to decide in a country what kind of so this whole thing of people people think that oh well you just got to go to work and if you work hard you'll be rewarded that's not the way it is in america anymore the people who work the hardest in this country make the least amount of money you know people like to shit on fast food employees i don't understand i never understood that people work at at restaurants why you want to shit on them they work at a restaurant you like fast food i like fast food so um anything so what so Look at what look at what unions gave you. They gave you paid vacation. They gave you an eight-hour workday. They got rid of child labor. They gave you the weekend. And guess what? They had to fight tooth and nail. People got killed. They had to fight. What's that? What's that saying? Power concedes nothing without a demand. Mm-hmm. So it's just, people. Aren't, they're not going to just be nice. So the reason why we have this big income disparity is because they decimated unions. Ronald Reagan really put that into over overdrive when he fired Patco, which was the uh, air traffic controllers union, fired all of them, and everybody just let it happen. Everybody went along. That's something. So strong labor movement is good for is good for everybody. Let's remember that a demand economy helps everyone. But right now, the criminals who run our economy, meaning the Wall Street bankers, they, they've forgotten the idea, what FDR taught everybody, that if you want to keep most of your money, you have to spread some of your money around to the people who are making the economy work. And so if you put money in the worker's pocket, he spends it. It actually boosts the economy. You put money in a rich person's pocket, nothing happens. They already have everything they need. They already have all their investments. They're going to take that money and put it offshore somewhere. So uh, strong unions help everybody. Rich people, poor people, workers, store owners. Everybody wins with strong unions. Well, you know, I personally, I belong to several unions. And um, as a teacher, I remember a couple years ago, um, I, a, a teacher who I have lunch with frequently, she was not a union member. And we have like about 90% union members at the school that I worked at. And she said, you know, I really don't see what's the point of having a union. I mean, we have everything that we need now. And I just don't see how a union would be purposeful. And I said, oh, yeah, German teacher. That's what she taught, German. She taught German. That's all she taught was German. I'm like, oh, there's a big market in public schools for the German teacher, I'm sure. And uh, she, I said to her, because we had these conversations, I said, okay, why don't you go and use your uh, your teaching credential and uh, your position market. and go and teach at a, a private school and see what those conditions are. Uh, why don't you go test your theory that you don't need a union anymore? Right. Guess what? She didn't leave our school. She stayed at our school. And I would have these conversations with her frequently. Really? You don't need a union? Then why don't stop, you leave? Stop sucking off, off our union. Right. Hard so, work. So there, yeah. So what she's doing is you, you, you do all the hard work and she gets all the ba- g- gains for it. And then she wags her finger at saying we don't need a union. Mm-hmm. And so I also love well, that. Just let me just add really quickly. She's now a union member. Ha. Why? Did she change her mind? Uh. Yes, she did. After seeing uh, time and time again that an administrator could just do whatever they wanted. And, uh, you know, she finally understood that you had to have collective bargaining and you had to have support uh, to be able to make sure that your voice was being heard and that you were being respected in the classroom. So there was another teacher at step school, uh, a guy teacher who said that. he doesn't believe in teacher unions because why should he be paid just as poorly as the worst teacher in the district? 
And Steph would say to him, "Why don't you go try? Well, why don't you go try your theory on the free market then?" Still there. Still there. Won't leave. Needs the union. You still going to stay here? Why don't you go test your theory? I'll go let the re- free market reward your great teaching. You're the best teacher in the district. I'm sure somebody will give you a ton of money. Why don't you leave? They never left. They never leave. They never test their theory. So if you ever see a teacher at a public school who isn't in a union, tell them to get the fuck out of there. Hey, why don't you go? Go. Why don't you go test your theory out? Go to a private school. They're everywhere. Oh, but you won't, will you? Well, I, I have a, for instance, we can all really appreciate. Uh, you know, just not too long ago, for five years, I was part of an industry where the pay scale, literally by dollar amount, not having anything to do with inflation, but literally by dollar amount, had gone down from the 80s until today. Wow. I'm talking about the world of stand-up comedy. Oh. The world of road comedy. You know, there was the boom that I hear about. I wasn't around for it, I but was. I hear about it. And Money then, was flying, baby. Yeah, I mean, pay scale has literally gone down on the road. Uh, even, even since from when I started, it's gone down a little bit still. Yeah, I, I thought you were going to say college professors. Because you used that, to teach college, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, that probably and that what, might be the same. I can't speak for look sure. Look what on they've that, done but... to professors, right? Adjunct professors make poverty wages, mm-hmm. and they do most of the teaching on colleges, mm-hmm. right? Oh yeah, yeah. There's some, it's, for instance, this where they even use temp agencies. Now. It's almost like it's rigged. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! It's almost like it's rigged. And the same thing's happening in journalism. And I had Thomas Frank on the show, and he said that uh, I said, "Why do you think the other professors don't stand up? Because they don't." The prof- other professors who have tenure, they're like, I got mine, screw you. It's the worst thing in the world. Mm-hmm. And journalists doing the same thing. That was that, we did a uh, video called Journalism's Death Rattle, going unnoticed by journalists, and that got demonetized. <laughs> <laughs> we hurt journalism's feelings. We hurt journalism. We, 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 uh, we advertisers, triggered journalism. Advertisers don't want to advertise on that. Um, so just so you remember, every this is what you got thanks to unions. You got the weekend, overtime pay, eight-hour workday, minimum wage, paid vacation, sick day, safety standards, child labor laws, health benefits, retirement security, and unemployment compensation. And they had to fight. Fight. Bunch of people said, you're not getting, why do you deserve to get that? Why do you don't deserve to get that? You shouldn't have a living way. What do you do all day? You just drive, you ride on a rail car? You know what I mean? Whatever they said to people. Which they say, oh, you flip burgers? Why should you have a life? I don't know, because you're working at an industry that makes billions of dollars and you're providing the labor to make it happen. That's why. <laughs> it's, just, mm-hmm. it's just weird. So the, the capitalists have gotten uh, poor people to turn on the poorer people. So if you have a union, people are, don't aspire to have a union. They, they aspire to take years away. Why should you get to have a good life? And I don't, it's that kind of crazy thinking. You know what I'm talking about, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So workers are pitted against each other. And like like people angry at freaking teachers. I had people say to me, do you know teachers make $100,000 a year? First of all, they should make twice that. Second of all, they don't. <laughs> why don't you go become a teacher then? If it's so easy and it's so lucrative, why don't you go be one? But you're not, are you? So, um, Jimmy, you also told me once that uh, you were glad you were a member of AFTRA because you would do most of what you would do for free. Oh, my God. So I never forget the first time I got a TV gig. It was um, I forget what it was. Maybe. I mean, I did cable like, you know, evening at the improv. There used to be a show that was on TV. VH, I did uh, Caroline's Comedy Hour. That was another one they used to tape in New York City. And then when I got on CBS, I did the Late Late Show, and um, or maybe it was the NBC's, I don't know. I did a bunch of shows, Friday Night Videos. I was on NBC a bunch, and uh, I, I forget who I was talking to. I remember the first time they go, hey, they want you to come down and do the show on NBC. And I go, uh, they go, you want to know the money? I go, I'll pay them 500 bucks. <laughs> 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 Wait a minute. I'll pay them. Because I would pay them. I would pay them to go on TV. So thank God we have a union. So now I got to be paid to go on TV. <laughs> right? Do you understand? Like, uh, it's same thing with even comedy clubs. I would pay them to go on stage at comedy clubs. I love doing comedy. I would pay them. But uh, thank God they paid us. Thank God. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, thank God we had AFTRA. But they still take advantage of everybody in the show business. The producers take advantage of everybody. And I think your first time that you did comedy on the road, you forgot to pick up your paycheck. I like doing stand-up comedy so much. The first time I ever did an out-of-town week was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I lived in Chicago. I got booked for a whole weekend from Thursday through Sunday to go tell jokes in Milwaukee. I was like, oh, my God, and they're going to pay me as much to tell jokes as I made laying bricks all week. I was like, what? And all I got to do is work a half hour a night and I get to drink? <laughs> and uh, yes, yes. And by the end of the week, I was so happy I forgot to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> you ever forget to get paid at your job? I bet you don't. I forgot to get paid. <laughs> no, my, my first run, I think one of the nights I did, the headliner was like, hey, here's your check, by the way. I don't know <laughs> you, but yeah, because I, I, I still have the itinerary from the first run that, that I you got. did. Like, yeah. I saved it on a computer. And Here's your check. Oh, that's yeah. right. We get money. Right. Okay, so thank God to the labor movement, and uh, we need to reinvigorate the labor movement. I don't understand why Walmart hasn't been unionized. What is the what is taking the AFL-CIO, or what is taking Trumpka? What is What are with the union leaders? How come you haven't been able to unionize Walmarts? How come you can't unionize fast food workers? What the What is the problem? Why is this such an un- insurmountable task? It's like I wanted to, I decided I was going to do something, and I was like, well, why don't we go unionize all the workers in California? we got to do something. Like, wh- why is that such a big, I-, I know people who are labor people. I'm, I'm going to talk to them. I think like almost Thomas Frank talks about a little bit about, you know, the movement, the New Deal, and how... Uh, eventually, uh, the Democrats said, you know what, that's old. Yeah, the, We've got other things planned. Mm-hmm. So Bill Clinton and Al Gore and the Democratic Leadership Council, which are neoliberals, which are not really liberals, what they are is like uh, just corporatists, right? Yes. So what they did was they got rid of the New Deal, and now instead of the New Deal, go get educated. Edu- be an innovator. Education. Get the job skills. Get retrained. It's everything except unionize. You know, when a guy's job gets shipped to a poorer person in a more desperate country, that doesn't help his pay. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, well, now, I think as a result of all that, too, there, there's a total stigma in the other direction now. I mean, people don't take the time to realize how dangerous right-to-work legislation is. And, and this administration is right. trying to make it uh, federal, which would pretty much end unions completely. So, again, I don't know. At some point, there will be a real revolution if somebody doesn't do it. Well, Paul Krugman predicted fascism coming to America. He did that in 2013. He said, if you don't do anything about in- the income inequality, if the Democrats don't, we're going to be stuck with a fascist right-wing demagogue. And, and so, and it's only gotten worse. So, uh, there's going to, something will happen. You can't fuck over half your country this hard. I mean, what's the percentage of people who can't even afford to have a $500 emergency, right? Some crazy 60% in the country? Yes. Don't quote me on that number, but we've already reported it in another video, but I just can't remember the numbers. So, uh, hey, hey to the labor movement and have a happy Labor Day and think about fighting the bastards. <laughs> This Labor Day, because you're going to have to fight the bastards, whether those bastards are management, whether those bastards are the the bought politicians. You're going to have to fight the bastards, whether it's Wall Street, whether it's the news media carrying water for them. You're going to have to fight those bastards. Power concedes nothing without a demand. And labor can get that done. That's why they're working so hard to decimate labor. Hey, everybody, we have two live Jimmy Dore shows in September. September 25th, we're in San Diego, and September 18th in Burbank, California. Get your tickets right there. There's a link right there.